a great smile. Has anyone told you that yet today? In fact, that is a $35,000 smile you're wearing right there. But I'm not here to talk about the average price of dental implants. I'm here to talk about the value of happiness and the rarity of it. 300 million people worldwide experience depression. 300 million. Between 2009 and 2017, depression among teens rose by 69%. Feelings of anxiety and hopelessness increased by 71. One out of five girls experienced major depression, and the suicide rate among teens rose by 56%. I'm here today to address these scary numbers. What brought us here? How can we untangle ourselves from this mess? These questions first started appearing for me when I entered high school. I had a fairly normal and happy childhood. I don't think I even knew the de definition of the word depression until I started my freshman year and suddenly teachers were handing out resource cards and there were therapists on campus and my peers were struggling with issues that I could barely wrap my head around. Suddenly, mental health struggles were so much closer to me than I expected, than I wanted. So around the start of my sophomore year when I started feeling this funny little thing called chronic sadness, uh, I bottled it up, and I didn't tell anybody. I know, it's super healthy. <laughs> but a part of me was denying that I even had these feelings at all, saying that I had accomplished so much in my 15 years of life. I had the basic material possessions that any human could need. I had running water, three meals a day, good friends, good family. I thought I had everything I needed to achieve happiness. So why was I so debilitatingly sad? I turned to the experts for answers. I delved into podcasts about positive psychology and books on behavioral science to answer to this sadness. And I found something. It's called hedonic adaptation. Hedonic adaptation basically states that despite what we experience, we will eventually return to the set level of happiness. You see, humans have this impeccable ability to mentally simulate an event before it actually happens. We're constantly thinking about how we'll feel if we fail our next math test, if we get into the college we want to. But usually, our predictions are way off. Think about how happy you are with your life right now. How many of you are 100% satisfied with everything in your life as it is right now? Can you raise your hands? I have maybe like three out of, what, 50, 60? Okay, how many of you are about 75% there? Okay, okay, good, 50, 20? Okay, so let me ask you this. What is preventing you from reaching that full 100? Is it that car you wanted since you got your license? Better grades, better looks, more money? You see, the poster trap of hedonic adaptation is that we constantly think, man, if I just got that 10% raise and a nicer car and a bigger house, I would finally be happy. But despite our lowest lows and our highest highs, we ride this wave back to a middle ground of emotional well-being. So to illustrate this further, let me tell you about one of my favorite studies. In 2010, two Nobel Prize winning Princeton psychologists Daniel Kahneman and Angus Deaton banded forces to answer the question, how much money do people need to be happy? And you'd think with what I just told you about hedonic adaptation that there is no amount. We'd keep wanting more and more in the pursuit of happiness. However, the researchers did find that life evaluation and emotional well-being increase until an average income of... Actually, I'm not going to tell you. I want you to guess. Can anyone throw out any numbers? $40,000, that's a pretty good guess. Anyone else? Yes. 80,000, 85? Wow, okay. Well, emotional well-being and life value increase until about $75,000. Additionally, the researchers asked participants how much money they would need to be happier. And the people who made $20,000 said they needed $40,000. The people who had $40,000 said they needed $60,000. And this pattern continued up to the millionaires who had everything but just wanted a couple thousand more. <sighs> See, the reason I love this study is that it literally proved that money cannot buy you happiness. And this pattern continues outside the subject of money. 
Psychologists have studied how people predicted they would feel versus how they actually felt after events like not getting a job, failing a driver's test, not getting tenure, even having a positive HIV test. So overwhelmingly, people overestimated how much the value of their lives and their emotional well-being would decrease after these negative events. So in short, hedonic adaptation states how horrible our minds are at predicting our happiness. It doesn't come from money, it doesn't come from material possessions, it doesn't even come from not having HIV. So where does true, authentic happiness come from? Let's go back a little to my sophomore year. After about four months of struggling with this chronic sadness, I finally told my parents. I finally asked for help. I finally got a diagnosis, started working with a psychologist. And then March 13th rolled around, and the whole world went inside. I remember on the first day of lockdown, my family decided that it would be a great idea to go up to Tahoe. <laughs> on the second day, the ski resorts closed, the hiking trails that my mom and I loved were gated up, our neighbors stopped coming over for dinner, and it snowed for five days straight. And the one thing I remember so deeply about this period in my life was how, how penetrating the loneliness felt and how constant and insurmountable it seemed. So I went back to my books and my podcasts. I screamed into my Google search bar, how do I make this feeling go away? And the answer was simple, be social. But of course, a worldwide pandemic was dominating that. However, research does show that being social is vital to our happiness and even to our survival. In 2002, psychologists Ed Diener and Juliana Schroeder, my bad, and Martin Seligman seemingly studied the, a group of the seemingly happiest people on earth, and they wanted to answer the question, what made these people so happy? Here's what they found. They found that out of everyone else, these people didn't exercise more, didn't participate in more religious activities, didn't have more objectively defined good events in their life, but they had good social connection. That no variable was sufficient for happiness except for good social relations. And the results were so strong that the scientists deemed being around others as a necessary condition for high happiness. Adding on to that, Diener and Seligman um, studied various activities and how people felt after they did these activities. And there were things like exercising, eating food, being around other people. And being social came in second on what makes you happiest. And if you can guess what the first one is, it's what they call in the professional world, intimate relations. <laughs> so uh, my note cards are empty after this. <laughs> Let me pull out the whole thing. So let's skip back a little. It's the middle of the pandemic and all of these psychologists are saying, all you need to do to be happy is go outside and talk to strangers. What the heck? It's the middle of a pandemic. The only people I was talking to were the strangers in the grocery line. But it turns out that talking to strangers is so good for you. <sighs> Let me tell you about one of my favorite studies. And it's Nick Epley's train experiment. So, a few years ago, a psychologist named Nick Epley was hired by Metra, the Chicago commuter rail system, to study how to improve customers' experiences on trains. So what he did was he created three groups. The first group was instructed to go talk to people, socialize. The second group was instructed to do what they usually do, whether that be talking or not. And the third group was told to keep to themselves. Now, if you guys were in this experiment, think, what group would you want to be in? How many of you would want to be in the solitude group? How many of you would want to be in the talking group? OK, good, you're learning. So. Funny enough, Epley asked the participants, where do you want to be? How do you think your journey will be if you talk to people versus not? And people thought that they would have a better journey without conversation. 
And as a 17-year-old female who loves to take advantage of public transportation, I can empathize. I don't know if the man in the back of the train is a pedophile or an axe murderer or both. But the reality is that 99% of people on Metra are neither of those things. So not only did Epley find that people expected to have a more enjoyable ride if they kept to themselves, but he proved them wrong. If you read the graph here, it's easy to see that the customers who connected with others had a much better experience than the customers who kept to themselves. So immediately, Epley took these findings back to the executives at Metra, and they said, you're not going to believe this, but we surveyed our customers asking what they want, and they said, solitude. We will be implementing a quiet car. But look at these numbers. Epley just proved that the exact situation was not going to make customers happy. So he said, Maybe there's a way out of this. Maybe there's, there's an opposite of a quiet car. And they said, oh, yeah. We used to have this little thing called a bar car. And a bar car was a special section on the train where people would get together over food and drinks and socialize. They loved it. But it was shut down in 2008. Why? Because it was too popular. <laughs> now, the reason this is my favorite study is because throughout our whole lives, we're fed the narrative, don't talk to strangers. But this study proved a flaw in that old saying. At some point, everybody in our lives are strangers. How can we be social without reaching out? So summer of 2020 eventually rolled around. We got out of Tahoe, came back home, and, oh, shoot, they didn't include the picture. But um, you can see him in here somewhere. One of those black fluffy things is my dog, Walter. And uh, little does he know, but he made my life so much easier that summer. <laughs> I put a post out on Nextdoor saying, hey, I have this giant soft orb of energy who needs playmates, help me. And I joined this group of community members who gathered at the middle school at 5 p.m. every day. The demographic was mostly soccer moms and one college kid. There was one woman whose daughter had a crush on my brother two years ago. There was one woman who threw a water bottle at this mean couple who called the cops on us every time they walked by. <laughs> this was not my typical crowd. But slowly, as I started to get to know these people, to talk to these strangers, I looked forward to five o'clock every day. <sighs> we played frisbee together. We played ping pong. I taught them how to tightrope. This picture is from a woman named Laura's birthday where they brought in a yoga instructor and we had an outdoor yoga class with our dogs. <laughs> the point is, I did not expect myself to enjoy talking to these strangers. But this small act of socialization helped me escape the effects of my depression that summer. It helped me to heal into a happier, healthier person. I hope what I've shared with you today can help you do the same. Here are my two podcast recommendations as promised. <laughs> These two shows, The Happiness Lab and Hidden Brain, are both about uh, breakthrough research and behavioral science and positive psychology that can answer literally any question imaginable. And lastly, I decided to share my story for two reasons. Number one, mental illnesses can be temporary and you can get better. And number two, reach out. We depend on others more than we expect. We mispredict our emotions more than we expect. Listen to the science and talk to strangers. I promise you it's worth it. Thank you so much. Thank you.